Uh, okay, I'm going to get started. And uh, oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to answer the question about hummingbirds. I have a slide on it. Don't worry. Um, it's a fun little topic. So yeah, I'm going to get started. Uh, and people will probably filter in as, as I talk. If everyone could just keep themselves muted, that'd be great. Just reduces the background noise that we might have. And uh, you can have your video on if you'd like, have it off, up to you. Um, I've got no qualms about that. Um, just making sure we're keeping muted so that there's no not a ton of background noise. Uh, so today's topic is fall migration or fall birding in Muskoka. And this is super useful for anyone uh, basically dealing with fall migration at all. Uh, we're going to, you know, Muskoka's fall migration is slightly different than the rest of Ontario's and the rest of North America's, but a lot of the same rules apply. Um, this is a picture of a Baird's sandpiper that I took out on out in Georgian Bay. And so I'm going to be talking about, you know, Muskoka as a whole, but also about, uh, you know, the Georgian Bay side of Muskoka. I have the benefit of being able to bird across most of Muskoka. So uh, it's a bit exciting for me to talk about migration because I get to see the whole range of it um, because our, my family has a cottage in Georgian Bay and I live in Bracebridge and I also drive <laughs> across Muskoka to go birding. So um, I, I have one of the one of the few birders that gets access to some of the outer islands that we have at Georgian Bay on, on the Muskoka side. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a very avid naturalist. And when I used to have uh, do birding presentations, it just said avid birder. But I've since branched out into dragonflies and butterflies and moths and plants and, you know, a little bit of everything. Because I'm finding that that broad knowledge about the natural world imp improves my birding skills. Uh, so uh, there's a story I might talk touch on today about you know knowing plant species, which plant species are important, um, can help you figure out where the birds might be. Um, and it's really interesting to be looking at kind of the whole picture because you get a much better sense of everything that might be going on. Uh, but birding specific, I am the regional coordinator for the Great Lakes market. Uh, and then I'm also a regional coordinator for the Breeding Bird Atlas of Ontario. So I, uh, along with several other very good birders in Muskoka, uh, do breeding bird surveys across uh, the Muskoka region. And it's a five-year program. So it, this was the first year of five. And we'll be kind of surveying all the different breeding birds that we have in Muskoka. Um, over the next five years. And with the Muskoka Conservancy, I'm the land stewardship coordinator, which basically means I get to go out on our properties um, and monitor them and run species surveys. And I am responsible for making sure those lands are stewarded in the best possible way. Um, so a little bit about Muskoka Conservancy is we are a Muskoka-based land trust so, which basically just means we protect property in its natural state. Uh, we currently protect 46 properties and they're protected in a number of different ways. So some properties have been donated to us and we're keeping them in their natural state. Uh, I think we have about 31 property donations um, uh, from a number of different donors. We've also purchased property from donations from some of our supporters. Uh, so that's a way we can acquire or have more targeted acquisition of our properties. Uh, and then we also have conservation easements where a private landowner retains ownership of their land. There's just a protective covenant uh, or a designated protected lands uh, on that property. 
So in total, we protect about 46 properties, and that's around a bit over 3,000 acres of land that we currently protect. Uh, and on many of these uh, properties, we run that Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program. We have a number of uh, bird surveys. So I run Marsh Monitoring Program. I also just do bird surveys uh, because we need to know what birds are breeding on our properties. So uh, it's a really great way to get a sense of what we have in Muskoka and to make sure that those the habitats for these sensitive species are protected in perpetuity. So looking forward to fall migration, the meat of the talk, uh, what everyone came to look for. And this, of course, is a photo I took in spring migration this year. Uh, so I'm cheating a little bit, but this is similar to what you would see during fall migration, large flocks of birds uh, migrating north uh, or migrating south for the winter. So this is a flock of Dunlin uh, that I photographed out in Georgian Bay, as you can kind of tell with all the rocky area. And uh, during our fall migration, we see potentially huge flocks of birds. Uh, Muskoka tends to have smaller flocks than you might see in other areas, just because of the way the natural area is laid out. But for example, in Georgian Bay last year for fall migration, we had a group of about 300 sandpipers uh, migrating through. So you can still see large flocks. We see large flocks of Canada geese or geese in general in Muskoka. We see large flocks of warblers. Um, but this is kind of the image that you hope to see during fall migration, lots of birds moving. However, fall birding is hard. It's not the easiest thing to be doing. Uh, I included this little meme of uh, confusing fall warblers, as they're called, CFWs. Uh, and it's uh, select all squares with natural warblers and a bunch of photos of birds that look almost identical. And I think in total in this photo, there's something like only two or three Nashville warblers. Uh, I didn't analyze it too in depth because fall warblers are challenging, but it's not the easiest thing, uh, especially when you're talking warblers and shorebirds, when they're in that period of molt, they look very different. And you could have two of the exact same species of warbler and they could look totally different. Um, I, I've seen a very juvenile chestnut-sided warbler and like an adult breeding plumage chestnut-sided warbler in the same flock of warblers. So you're getting a very variable look at all these different birds. However, uh, fall, fall migration is very rewarding. It's when we have many of our rarities passing through Muskoka and Ontario. Um, in fact, during the spring, I was monitoring the rare bird alerts that we were getting. And, you know, there was a few rare birds popping up in the spring, but nothing too unusual across really all of Ontario. And you hit fall and all of a sudden we're seeing swallow-tailed kites making their way north or, you know, Hudsonian godwits on their migration south. Lots more rare birds coming in. And this is a photo taken last fall migration. Uh, and it was a species, uh, two species of plover, actually. Um, we have a American golden plover on the top and a black-bellied plover on the bottom. And they look really similar. Uh, the only reason we could identify these for sure is because we got some photos of them. Uh, but American golden plovers have, I think, under 10 records in Muskoka. So they're not commonly seen. Uh, and we only see them, you know, once every few years, whereas black-bellied plovers, a little bit more regular, but still a quite uncommon uh, species of plover that you might see. And we tend to see these slightly more in our fall migration. That's when we get some of these rarities because their migration path is different in the fall than it is in the spring. Here's another photo um, taken last fall migration, which for those of you on iPads or iPhones or your phone in general, you may not see the bird in the photo. Uh, this was a bird 
that was northeast-ish of uh, Toronto. And there's it zoomed in. There's the bird. Uh, it is a variegated flycatcher. And this is the best photo I got of it. They're a South American bird. Uh, they breed down in South America. They don't really go north of Mexico. In fact, if you were to look at their range map, you wouldn't see really anything north of, you know, about halfway up Mexico. And this was our second record in Ontario um, of all time, or, you know, of all recorded birds. And I believe it was the eighth or ninth record north of Mexico. So really rare bird. Um, and it just happened to come up last uh, fall. There was that two, two week period of really balmy, warm weather. This bird showed up. Two days later, it started snowing. That's when I went to see the bird. Um, and the, the, tie, the day that I took this photo was the last day the bird was seen. So it, I think it showed up for about three days in total, disappeared. Uh, and that was just an odd vagrant popping up from South America, showing really well for about three days, and then disappearing. And that's quite common in our fall migration, getting those odd vagrants like an Anna's hummingbird from BC or you know, a Eurasian goose species that we saw last year as well. Um, so that's when we get those really rare species popping up. Um, so very exciting time uh, fall migration is. And the last thing to kind of hit, uh, like hammer this point home is this video I'm gonna show you of snow geese migrating. Uh, this was taken last fall migration as well. And I think we estimated about 30,000 individuals uh, in total. And so the white that you're gonna see on the ground is not snow, it's snow geese. All those dots in the air, I think 98% of them are snow geese. Um, and it was just, we were driving in Ottawa, we saw two white things in the fields. And we drove there, found the flocks, parked our cars, and for about five minutes, birds were just streaming in. Normally, when you see migration, it's like a flock passes you. This was just a constant stream of birds coming in. And so all those white dots are snow geese. Everything in the air is snow geese. It was just an amazing spectacle. And that's something uh, you really only see during fall migration. Um, so yeah, you can see all those black dots are snow geese. All of that is a, just a huge flock of snow geese. Um, and again, uh, five minutes of these birds flying in. So very exciting thing to be able to see um, in fall migration. Uh, and apologies for my shaky camera work. It was very cold and very windy. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to get into how to figure out what you're looking at. You, saw, you see a bird, but you have no idea what you're seeing. Um, so I'm gonna go through a, a, some different groups of birds. And that's kind of the way I structured my presentation is going through groups of birds. Because if I were to say, here's five different species of warblers and how to tell them, you would end this presentation with, no memory of the you know 20 so birds that I, I went through. You wouldn't be able to say like, if I showed you what a yellow rumped warbler is, you wouldn't see a yellow rumped warbler and say that I know what that is. You would say, I forgot everything Aaron told me and I'm gonna need to watch that presentation like 20 times before I figure anything out. So what I want to do is let's narrow it down to a family or a group of species that you can then look in your field guide and say, I, I know what this is. So warblers are small birds uh, that tend to forage high in the trees as they're passing through. And we're just after about the apex of warbler migration in Muskoka. They'll be migrating through until about mid-October, uh, but we've had some really good days in the past week where they've been migrating through and it's starting to wind down just a little bit. Uh, so get out while you can if you have the chance. There's usually some amount of yellow on the bird. So they're, you know, small chickadee sized birds with usually some amount of yellow, either in the face, uh, on the breast or under the tail, on the back, on the crown. Um, you can see on this bird, there's some yellow um, kind of on the 
chin and on the breast um, parts of the bird. The key thing that you're looking for when we look for warblers is not the head pattern, not the coloration. You can see yellow and say that's a warbler, but leave it at that, especially when you're starting out because in the fall, warblers have such a huge variation in plumage. Like I talked earlier, you can see two yellow rumped warblers and think they're two totally different species. So there's kind of three things that I recommend looking for. Um, that's our undertail coverts, eye rings, and wing bars. Maybe I'll make that a little bit easier to read. Uh, undertail coverts are this group of feathers that are in shade right there, kind of the butt of the bird. And they're either yellow or white in, I think, almost every case. So look for the color there. Usually what you see from the bird too, the first thing you're going to see is the butt because they're up high. You're looking up at them um, from the bottom. So uh, looking for this coloration is going to help narrow it down. Some warblers have white, some have yellow. If you figure out which one it is, you can cross out like half the warblers. Next thing to look for is eye rings. This little uh, ring uh, around the eye right here. So you can see that right there. Um, and that's a usually white, can be yellow, something like that. Uh, sometimes it's broken, so it's not a full eye ring. Sometimes it's more like eye arcs. So an arc on the top, arc on the bottom. Uh, but you really want to figure out if it has one at all, and then if it's full or unbroken. And that, again, can narrow down those different species of birds. Um, so this one does have an eye ring. You can kind of see it quite faintly. And then look for the wing bars. You'd be able to see the wing bars on the wing of the bird right here. And presence or absence of wing bars is another good tell. And so if you can get those three things, um, you'll be able to say, okay, I can narrow it down to maybe two or three species of warbler and then use coloration. Because if you're starting with coloration, if we think back to that, select all squares of natural warblers, and there was like 10 species of warbler in there. If you're seeing yellow and gray, you're not gonna be able to narrow it down. But if you can see yellow and gray with an eye ring or yellow and gray with wing bars, you're gonna have a much easier time of narrowing it down. Uh, so that's my recommendation for warblers. Find those flocks of quickly moving birds. Uh, listen for chickadees. That's one of the key things. Uh, chickadees often will come in these mixed warblers flocks. So if you're listening for chickadees, hear them, grab your monoculars, run outside, try to figure out what else is there. Um, and then, yeah, look for those three things to help narrow down what, what warbler you might be looking at. So the next group of birds that I want to talk about is sparrows. And for sparrows, ignore everything that I just said and look at the head pattern. Um, because the head pattern for sparrows is very beneficial. So when we're looking at sparrows, you're going to see usually a little brown bird. Um, you might see some orange on it. You might see some yellow. You might see some white. Uh, but tends to be kind of brown overall. When you're looking at sparrows, like I said, look for the head pattern. Look for nape, which nape is the back of the neck here. Look for the crown stripe up here. And the other thing I don't have listed is look for the eye striping and or presence of a mallar stripe. So that's a lot of things right there to, to go at. Let's kind of focus on the nape first. Uh, the nape is going to be uh, a tricky thing to see, but often you can get a good sense just from looking at the back of the neck. Uh, this bird has a little bit of streaking that you can kind of barely tell. Sometimes it's going to be a clean nape, so no streaking. Sometimes it'll be gray. Uh, so looking at that, whether there's streaking there, what the coloration is. Um, and then if we look at the crown stripe, is it white? Is it gray? Is it another color? This one is white, which is one of the ways you can start narrowing it down. Uh, when I saw this bird, we kind of instantly narrowed it down to LeConte's or Nelson Sparrow. LeConte Sparrow has a streaked nape and Nelson Sparrow has a gray nape. So, you know, one tick right here, streaked nape. Uh, Nelson Sparrow has a gray crown stripe. LeConte Sparrow has a white crown stripe. Color of crown stripes helps narrow it down. 
Uh, other sparrows, it's really important to look at that, um, the line that goes through the eye. So some sparrows will have a line that goes from the bill to the eye. Some sparrows will only have like, uh, have a line going eye to the back of the head. So like this LeConte sparrow, we see a, no line here, but we see a line uh, or no line from the bill to the eye, but we see a line from the eye back to the, to the nape. So again, that's a very helpful way. Like song sparrows will have a line from the eye all the way to the back of the nape going through the eye. So look there and then look at the mallard stripe. That's kind of the mustache stripe of the bird. Does it have a thick one? Does it have a thin one? Is it absent? So th this bird has a very thin one um, that you can kind of see just a little bit. But that's a key thing. Sparrows look at the head. That's the easiest way to start narrowing down different species. Warblers don't look at the head. <laughs> just look for the coloration and then those three things I talked about. The other thing when you get more experience with sparrows is you can look at the habits and habitat. Um, that's where that plant identification being a kind of general naturalist is going to help. Uh, because uh, if you know what habitat it likes or where it migrates through, um, that can help a lot. So for example, Leconte sparrows, we've seen four, there's four records in Muskoka. This photo is the third record from last year, which is the, the bird that I found. And then we had a fourth record this year from two days ago. Um, and both times we found these birds, they were in the bulrushes. They were spending a lot of time in cattail bulrushes and not a lot of time elsewhere. Um, and sometimes they would kind of duck in between the grasses and the cattails. But, you know, looking along the cattails was the easiest way of finding the bird. Um, habits is another really good thing. Song sparrows will pump their tail. So when you flush them, they'll fly quickly into brush and pump their tail right before they land. Savannah sparrows, you'll kind of flush up the path. And then at some point, they're going to do a big, long looping flight all the way back to where you first saw them. Uh, Leconte sparrows, when we saw it fly, it kind of looked like it was a very shaky, fluttery flight. Um, and it would flush fly a distance and then disappear deep into the undergrowth. So those different habits, habits can also help figure out what species of sparrow it is. But that's more of like an advanced trick once you get good at identifying sparrows. Shorebirds uh, are another kind of tricky species. Uh, if you were to look at this photo, you would think, boy, those look like two of the exact same species of shorebird. They're not. <laughs> They're two different species of shorebirds. Um, the left shorebird is a white-rumped sandpiper. The right is a semi-palmated sandpiper. Uh, so tricky, and especially in the fall when they're molting in different plumage and different uh, times of their plumage. When I was out birding this fall, I saw three least sandpipers. And they had, there was a gray one, there was a sort of brown one, and then there was a very brown one. Three of the same species just look totally different. Um, so plumage is not a super helpful thing. To identify a shorebird, you're looking for long legs and a longer bill. So you're seeing this long, thin bill on both birds, longer legs on both birds. And my advice with shorebirds are get photos. I, I wish there was something easier to do, but when you're starting out bird, birding or even like somewhat experienced birder, sh photographs are your best friend with shorebirds. There are people that can look at the silhouette of the shorebird and tell you what species it is, but that takes years of practice. So if you're, you know, starting out, you really like shorebirds, take a ton of photographs because that's going to be your easiest way of getting a good sense of what it is. So for example, with the white rub sandpiper, when we saw this in the field, we wrote it down as a semi-palmated, but it wasn't. Um, there are some you know, small things you can see. The wingtips went past the tail, uh, which would be right here. Wingtips were passing the tail. It had more of this barrel chested look to it. Um, this one also kind of, looks a little barrel chested, but this had kind of a more significantly like chunky look to it. 
But again, these are things that I've been looking at shorebirds out in Georgian Bay for years now and taking lots of photos, figuring them out. Now, and even this one, when we saw it in the field, we said semi-palmated, two semi-palmated sandpipers. We looked at the photos later and that's when we realized it was something else. So photographs are your friends and that's my best advice for shorebirds. Um, there's other things you can do, but photographs and looking at them later and sending them to experts is the best way to kind of quickly learn those birds. Uh, raptors. Raptors are migrating right now. We're seeing some large flights of broad-winged hawks south of us um, in Toronto. I had reports of like 10,000 birds migrating in a day. Uh, raptors tend to be large soaring birds with uh, quite big wingspans. Um, so this is Despite what some people might think, this is a juvenile bald eagle. So bald eagles go through four different uh, molts. They have a first year, a second year, a third year, and an adult or fourth year molt. Um, so this is, I believe it's their second year, first or second year molt. Uh, they get a lot more white in the tail and the head for their third year molt. Um, so I believe uh, it's a second year molt. And what you want to look for, because they're all they're usually going to be soaring when you see them is look for the underwing pattern. So you can see the underwing patterning right here um, and the, the tail patterning, what you might see on the tail. So broad winged hawks have a very thick white band on the tail. That's a good way to tell them. The way you can tell this between a bald and a golden eagle is it's very patchy white and there's a lot of white on the underwing. Golden eagles have like a single patch of white on the, on the underwing. Um, so again, a bit of a trickier one, um, but you can also see some white on the tail there. It's starting to molt its tail feathers. Um, so you would know it's a bald eagle from that as well. So looking when they're, you know, soaring above you, look at where is the white? Where is the different colors? Do they have a breast band? Red winged hawks have this very kind of thick breast band, um, of kind of large blotchy, um, gray stripes. So learn what a, what a raptor looks like in flight, because usually, especially in the fall, what you're seeing is them move, moving from the north to the south, uh, and they're going to be just soaring above you. So learning what they look like when they're perched is not helpful. Learning what they look like when they're flying is, is way more helpful. It's going to take you a lot farther. And then you can also watch the way they fly. For example, turkey vultures have this very rocking flight. They have a dihedral when they fly, which is a kind of v-shape to the wings um, but very rocking they kind of look tip side to side when they're flying um occipiters have a flat flap glide kind of flight style the flap flap glide flap flap glide um some birds will have a slight dihedral so a slight view in the wings a lot of hawks will fly with just very straight across flat wings so watch the way they fly as well that might help but learning what the different tail patterns underwing patterns are are going to be probably the most helpful thing you can do another group of our uh migrating birds are waterfowl this is kind of our ducks our grebes or geese many other different types um, loons uh, lots of different species of waterfowl that we're looking at this is a group of bufflehead uh, five buffalo heads at, uh, I believe this was the Upjohn Nature Reserve. And they migrate through Muskoka in fairly large numbers, and you can kind of see them in any water body. So a great place to look is Muskoka Beach. On Muskoka Beach Road, there's, you know, a public beach with a good lookout uh, right where some water flows in, so it freezes relatively late. That's a great place to look for waterfowl. You can take your scope there or just binoculars in you know, mid-October and see five or six different species of ducks. Rarities show up anywhere there's open water, you might see rarities. Big lakes tend to be slightly better, uh, but you can see them at the sewage lagoons. You can see, like, we have black scoters off in Port Sydney we had last year. Uh, we've had red-throated loons on uh, Muskoka Beach. We've had white-winged scoters on Kirby's Beach. So you just got to get out there and look really is the key to, to finding those rarities is spending some time at some open bodies of water in the fall and just looking at different birds. 
Um, and again, tricky thing to identify the different types of waterfowl, but things to look for are uh, the bill shape, whether it's a short stubby bill like we see in the buffle head, long pointed bill is more of like a loon kind of thing. Um, like a spatulate bill, like a thicker, wider bill is some, some species of ducks like our canvas back, our shoveler have a more spatulate shaped bill. So shape of bill can help uh, where the white is on their face um, or on their body. And then if you see it in flight, where the white is on the wings. So the underwing pattern like hawks can be quite telling as to what different species of duck it is. Uh, but again, that's it's a really big category. You could have a single webinar just on waterfowl and talking about the differences um, in the different ducks and grebes and geese and and you know telling how to figure out each one of them. Um, again, you know, best thing for waterfowl photographs if you can, or go out with an experienced birder and you know chat with them about how they're identifying them because it's such a large group that we can't really just break it down in a 45 minute webinar, unless we're only focusing on waterfowl. But the one thing I will suggest, and this maybe goes for all birds, is look for the different bird. So figure out what a buffle head looks like and find the one buffle head looking bird that's kind of different. Cause that's how you would figure out, like a harlequin duck looks similar to a buffle head significantly rarer but if you know what a buffalo head looks like you might be able to see the one that looks slightly different so look for different birds we're going to see large flocks of a bunch of different ducks look for that single different looking bird and that might help you find a rarity and then hummingbirds this is a question early on from donna uh do we still feed hummingbirds so lots of people probably haven't seen their hummingbirds in the last week. Um, many of them have started migrating. Um, our fall hummingbirds are usually vagrants, which means it's something like an Anna's hummingbird from uh, British Columbia, or it's uh, we had a Calliope hummingbird from south of us come up. So hummingbirds are a tricky species, especially because we're only familiar with the ru ruby throated. So if you see something different, it may be difficult because there's not many birders in Muskoka that are super familiar with other species of hummingbirds. But what you can do is keep your fit feeders up until about mid-October, even into November. Really, you can keep them up until it starts freezing. Uh, but most of the hummingbirds that would show up in October are going to be a rare hummingbird because all of our hummingbirds have migrated south. and you know, if a hummingbird pops up in Muskoka in October, it's going to need food and it's going to come to a feeder. Um, there's not going to be a lot of wildflowers left for it to kind of keep its strength up. So look for birds out of the ordinary. Keep those feeders up until October. If you see a hummingbird in October, send me an email because it's probably something rare. And you're probably more likely to have a rare hummingbird in October than you are to have a ruby throated. So, yes. Up until mid October, maybe November. If you, I mean, feed it until feed them until it freezes because you never know when things will pop up. So, where to bird in Muskoka? We have a lot of different uh, birding spots. Muskoka is very interesting in that we have a lot of area, like a lot of land in Muskoka that's very hard to access. Um, so, a lot of road allowances that you could walk to get to a wetland. Um, there's, you know, kind of less manicured trails in Muskoka than south of us. And the other thing about birding in Muskoka as opposed to Toronto is birds have way more habitat here. So if you're birding in Toronto, birds are stopping where there aren't buildings, which is, you know, parks. It's a lot smaller of an area for them to stop. Um, whereas in Muskoka, when they start flying over Muskoka, they say, whoa, <laughs> tons of land here. I can go anywhere. <laughs> So we're gonna, you're going to see them in several spots where they kind of congregate. But, you know, there's probably millions of birds in Muskoka that are passing through where no one could possibly see them. Um, so some good places that we've had historic good success with birds 
Upjohn Nature Reserve. That's a Muskoka Conservancy property uh, just north of Bracebridge on Nichols Road. And you can actually Google map Upjohn Nature Reserve if you want to hike there. There's trails um, and they go right by a wetland. And we have really good luck with warblers, especially in the spring. Um, but often in the fall, you'll get some good warblers passing through there too. Uh, and I would say it's one of the places where we see our earliest warblers in the spring. So we see very early warblers coming through Upjohn in the spring um, as opposed to other places. Don't know why. There's a lot of red maple there. That could be the reason. Uh, but that's a great place to get. You might get some waterfowl. You might get some um, warblers. You get a good variety of birds there. Scoping large lakes or Georgian Bay. Uh, large lakes are a little bit easier. We have a lot of public beaches, Kirby's Beach, Boyer's Beach, Muskoka Beach, a lot of different beaches. Take a scope or some binoculars there and just, you know, spend half an hour looking at the different ducks that are coming in. Georgian Bay is a bit trickier. Not as many people want to drive that far out. I have found about four spots in Georgian Bay where you have access to the bay if you don't have a cottage. Georgian Bay does not have as many public beaches that, as we do in Muskoka proper. Uh, so that's a bit trickier, but you're likely to get something rarer. So if you can get out to Beausoleil in October, that's a great place to look for grebes. Tons of grebes out in Beausoleil. Um, lots of ducks out in Beausoleil. So, so uh, Georgian Bay is a great place if you're able to kind of figure out where you can scope from. Uh, and then the sewage lagoons, Always a great place. We get lots of waterfowl passing through there, lots of ducks. Um, you can see, you know, upwards of 10 species of ducks on a good day. Uh, lots of warblers pass through there. So it's a good place. Um, one of the best places for sparrows, actually, if you really like sparrows. Uh, so you can check that out there right in Bracebridge. Um, just don't drive in, park outside. Uh, and if you need more tips, just send me an email. Uh, I spend some amount of time there in the fall. Uh, and then your own house, listen for chickadees. Like I said early, chickadees are the signal of a mixed flock of birds, whether that's warblers or vireos or nuthatches. Uh, you don't know until you check. So listen for those chickadees, grab your knocks, pop out of your house and start looking because that's when you're gonna, that's when you're gonna see those flocks moving through. And then how to support birds. So how are we gonna, you know, make sure that uh, our birds will keep coming here. We're gonna, that we'll see lots of birds going into the future. The, there's a number of citizen science programs through Muskoka Conservancy, but there's a number through Birds Canada as well. Um, so we run pro Project Protect, which is our marsh monitoring program um, for marsh birds. There's a loon program uh, for, through Birds Canada, which is, I think, the Canadian Lake Loon Survey. There's nocturnal owl surveys. There's night jar and whippoorwill surveys. Lots of different citizen science programs to help monitor those populations of sensitive birds. Uh, support local land trusts. So we have uh, in Muskoka, Muskoka Conservancy is, I mean, the Muskoka-based one. GBLT is our Georgian Bay-based one. Kuchiching is the Simcoe-based uh, land trust. The great thing about land trusts is they protect habitat for species before those species potentially are species at risk. Uh, so this is maybe more pertinent with things like dragonflies, um, but I've discovered a number of species uh, breeding on our properties that maybe in the future will become a species at risk. So local land trusts are a great way to protect the habitat for species um, and really, you know, make give the birds a spot where they're going to be able to keep coming back to. Uh, and then upload sightings on eBirds if you uh, or on eBird. If you're comfortable knowing what you're looking at, post it on eBird um, or something like iNaturalist where you can get an identification for the bird. Um, but what eBird does is you post what you see um, and they've created migration maps and population um, like how many birds are moving through a given area. So you get kind of the mapping on what their migration paths are. Uh, you can kind of get a sense of how many of a given species there are by looking at like number of reports in a year. Uh, so eBird is a really fantastic tool um, for monitoring bird populations. 
uh, across Muskoka and across really all of all of the world. So it's a great tool to just even check out and look at like the migration path for a white rum sandpiper. Um, it's it's very interesting to see where these different birds are popping up. Uh, okay, so I'm going to end it there. Uh, if anyone has any questions. Uh, I'd be happy to answer them. You can type them in the chat um, and I can answer any question based, like bird based, or if you have another weird question I about nature, I can probably answer it too. Uh, so feel free to type in the chat. I uh, got a question from Jane already. Um, what type of feed should we put our feeder uh, in our feeders? Ah, good question. So you can start... A lot of people don't feed in the summer because of bears, um, and that is an issue in Muskoka, especially if you're in a rural setting. There, it does attract bears um, feeding birds. However, you're probably good to start feeding. I usually start feeding about mid October or end of September. Um, the type of feed is pretty variable. Uh, I prefer. Uh, just sunflower seeds, black oil sunflower seeds, that proves to be kind of the best for a wide range of birds. If you're looking for like nut hatches or late warblers or woodpeckers, suet is really good. Um, a lot of birds kind of feed on suet. You might get a wren um, as well, like a rare wren coming through. Uh, so, so suet feeders are qu quite good. Um, and then Niger, once we hit winter, finches love niger seed. Um, so putting out a little bit of niger seed. So we usually have a mix of black oil, sunflower seeds, niger, and suet on our feeders. I would caution against the mixed bird seed uh, packages. Often they contain a lot of millet. Um, and most birds don't eat millet. It's really just blackbirds. Um, they just kind of kick it to the side. So it's really just a filler seed um, that most birds don't eat. So uh, I would I would stay away from the kind of millet or mixed seeds. Uh, the one other good thing if you want blue jays or jays is uh, whole peanuts. Uh, it's a bit more expensive, but there's, uh, whenever I put out whole peanuts, they're gone in about a half an hour. So um, that's another great one. Uh, any other questions? Yes, mixed bird seed without millet is fine. It's the one, uh, it's the mixed mixed seed with uh, millet is not good. I mean, it's it's not bad. You're just going to have a lot of blackbirds coming through in, in April and May, which I love, but not everyone loves tons of blackbirds. Uh, was that a Townsend's warbler? Oh, good guess. Um, it was not a Townsend's warbler. I'll just go back. Uh, this is a this is really a Muskoka spe Muskoka specialty, but it's <laughs> it's a Muskoka specialty for people in Georgian Bay. Uh, this is a prairie warbler, uh, which breed up the coast of Georgian Bay. Pretty much, uh, you have to be slightly north of Cognacine to rake well, or Beausoleil or no north, um, and out on the bay bay not like in the woods. Um, absolutely gorgeous bird, very pretty song. It's just this kind of like ascending trill. Uh, but, so it's a Muskoka specialty in that, in a region of Muskoka, they're very easy to see. Like my cottage, we have, you know, like six of them singing in the spring and then two or three that nest in the area. But outside of that, area of Georgian Bay right along the coast, which is not super easy to access, you don't see them at all. So it's a Muskoka specialty in that if you know where they are and you have access to where they are, you can get them no matter what. Like I get a prairie warbler within five minutes of stepping off the boat every single year. But if you don't have access to that, then it'll be very tricky to see one. Uh, best food for cardinals. Cardinals are such an um, absolutely gorgeous bird. Uh, I would I would not say there's a specific best food for them. Cardinals are tricky in that they're very territorial. So they'll sit on a territory and because they don't migrate, that's their territory year round. So the unfortunate 
fact of that is you either have them or you don't. You might get one migrate, um, like one coming through in the fall or the spring, like a young juvenile trying to look for territory. But you tend to either have them or don't have them. And sometimes you'll have them for 10 years and they'll disappear. Um, and then you might have them five years later. Uh, but they'll kind of stay within their territory. So we have a pair uh, in Bracebridge at our feeders that nest. They actually nested in our yard this year. That We lost the nest, unfortunately. But uh, I know another birder who lives about 500 meters away from me, and they never see cardinals. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of an either if you have them, like you either have them or you don't. But we find they come to black oil sunflower most frequently. So you could try putting out sunflower seeds. You might attract them. Uh, but I think actually the one thing that I've heard, and I have to do some more research on this, is you can attract them with plant species. So they nest in, they sometimes nest in, uh, I can't remember the plant species, but you can potentially attract them to a territory by planting more native species. Uh, is it late for cardinals to be feeding young? Uh, that's all birds could potentially st still be free feeding young. So my guess what happened is uh, when I talked about that kind of rainstorm, it washed out some nests. Potentially there was a lot of chick mortality and those birds might have nested a second time, which means they might be feeding young still. If you see them feeding young, it, it, it would be kind of late for it, but some of those birds may have taken like the chance and said, we're going to nest a second time, hopefully have a successful nest before we migrate south. Uh, so if it stays warm, those birds might survive, but it's a chance that some birds may have taken and that if they lost their nest early in June or mid-June, they might have attempted to nest again. And so their young might just be fledging now. Um, yeah, so lining strings up. Uh, yeah, so you can have feeders. You just have to be creative in how you use them um, during the spring or during the summer. Because uh, once the bears kind of come out of their hibernation, you run into issues of them coming into your yard. So uh, figuring, out <laughs> figuring out a system to keep your feeders bear-proof and not attracting bears is a good thing. If you're living in one of the town centers, you're probably fine. If you're living in a rural area, be cautious and, and make some preparations. So figure out a way to keep your feed, feeders up. Maybe switch from black oil sunflower seeds to just the shelled sunflower seeds, which is going to be more expensive, but isn't going to have the mess associated with it. So uh, yeah, there are ways to feed birds during the summer. Bringing your feeders in at night is another good one. Yeah. So there are ways to do it, but yeah, just be careful. Uh, we have a, like a big, uh, platform feeder that we can't move. So I just tend to stop feeding birds. Uh, they, there's also a lot of native food for them during, uh, the summer. So it's kind of less of a necessity. The reason like birds only get about 10% of their diet from bird feeders. Um, and the reason they're so beneficial, especially in the winter is that if there is like a cold snap or really bad weather, it's a, like a secure source of food that they know they can get food in. So if there's, you know, that huge weather event that, you know, drops it to minus 50 or something for two days, the birds are going to appreciate having that like reliable source of food that isn't hard to acquire as opposed to, you know, having to look for natural food in the winter that's going to be hard to find like an ice storm hits they're going to come to bird feeders right they're because a lot of their other food is going to be frozen so it's most key to have your feeders up in the winter and the kind of shoulder seasons where they're more affected by weather in the summer you're still going to get birds at your feeder but slightly less important because the weather is a little bit more uh kind of predictable for them uh i mean mind you with climate change, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, but a bird bath is another good thing to have during uh, the summer because birds will come to water. 
we see our American goldfinches in the pond, our little pond like year round because, or, you know, until it freezes because they like having that little source of water. So having a bird bath is a, is a great way to kind of attract birds to your yard as well. If you don't have a, a natural source of water. Um, so if there's no more questions, uh, I'll just give it a couple of minute, uh, a minute if people have any other questions that spring to mind. Uh, but yeah, um, hopefully this helps you with fall migration. Hopefully you can at least, you know, narrow stuff down to a family of, uh, sp family of birds as opposed to just looking at pretty birds, which I still like just doing, uh, just looking at birds is fine for me, but, uh, narrowing it down is going to help you become a better birder because, you know, if you, if you know where a sparrow is, or if you know it's a sparrow, you can start narrowing down the species. And for example, like when I went to South Africa to go birding, I read the whole field guide. I didn't remember any of the birds, but I could look at a bird and say, oh, I know about where in the field guide that is. Um, and so I could say, oh, that's a wax bill or that's, a, um, you know, wida, like that's what you want to be doing is, oh, I know that's a sparrow. Let me flip to the sparrow section and narrow it down. Um, yes, plain suet is great. Packaged kind is, yeah, is kind of iffy. There's a couple, I would just, I would shop around. Um, if like plain suet is great. Um, I would, if you can get plain suet, totally the best. I, I know you can ask for it in like grocery stores sometimes. Uh, but yeah, shop around a little bit. You might find something that works for your region. So like maybe Cardinals really prefer like a fruit mix, or maybe you can prepare like a fruit suet or a dried fruit suet that attracts certain birds um, so you can do like a little bit of shopping around to figure it out but you know plain suet black black oil sunflower seeds and niger seeds are like three go-tos that you're always going to have success with uh but you know there is there's like you know tree oh, there's uh like a, a it's like a suet bark or something that you can like uh st paste on your trees in the winter that birds will come to um, like for woodpeckers and stuff, I've, I don't know if it's like bark butter or like, it's called something, it's like suet butter. I'm not quite sure, but you can like put it on your trees and that'll attract birds. So there's a lot of different options out there. Uh, but don't, don't buy, I guess don't buy food based off what birds on the cover, because you're probably not going to get that bird. Um, do it like, you know, do some breeding online, send me an email black oil sunflower seeds is my go-to. So, um, okay. So I'm going to end the webinar there then, uh, with no more questions. And again, it will be, uh, public or it will be available once I upload it onto YouTube and put it on our website. Uh, and yeah, um, thanks everyone for tuning in and hope you, uh, can go out and get some great birds. Um, and if you see anything rare, send me an email. <laughs> Have a great rest of the day, guys.